you know, going through a season, this last season of my life, I came to a point where I was like, God, it, it's just like I'm driving in a rainstorm and it's raining so hard that my wipers can't keep up with the storm. Yeah. But I said in that uh, brokenness, it was like I got a revelation that I don't see God. I don't feel God, you know, but I know he sees me. Yeah. Welcome to Believe Right Television. We want to continue a little bit from where we were on the, on the last program. I realize if you're tuning in with us for the first time and this still might be appropriate for you, you know, we're going to, but we're kind of building on what we talked about before, but it'll still be good for you. We're talking about what it is after you're born again and how if you, you have to learn God as your father, which can be a real challenge if you have not had a good parenting situation, which in today's world, you know, with the divorce rate as high as it is, many, many children have had to pick between two parents or the other parent wasn't around and they were pretty much abandoned. And, and that's another issue. But abandonment creates a whole bunch of emotional things for people. When you feel like you've been abandoned, I mean, how do you trust people again? And, and if you've been treated really bad by the parent or the person that was supposed to protect you, it creates even a more issue and we're going to try to address some of that today because to see God as your father is probably the most important thing you can learn about God that God sees you as a son or a daughter as a matter of fact when Jesus said when you pray he said pray like this say our father who art in heaven so God's relationship with you will be one of a father and if you've had a bad image of a father you're just going to have to work it out with God I hate to tell you that this but you can't avoid it it's something that you have to, the healing that needs to take place from being abandoned or abused by your parents uh, leaves you with a wound and God can't get close enough to you. I, I remember when God was uh, dealing with me on something, I, I, I talked about cigarettes last week, but I'll tell the rest of the story. After I did get delivered from cigarettes, I, I asked God about it because I smoked a long time after I was saved. He said, to, he says, you couldn't take correction, so I didn't say anything for a while because you couldn't take the correction. You were too wounded, so I just let it go, and I brought it up when it was, was the right time. How do you like that? It's good. I mean, we always get that. And now, if you're a person, if you're a religious person, you're going to think you know better than God, and they all should quit smoking because you said so. <laughs> and that is so unfair to heap all of that on people. That's like saying, you better quit drinking. You better stop flirting. You better quit smoking. I mean, you can't really stop because of the, the things you've got built into your personality, and it takes time. So God healed me up first a little bit before he started talking about correcting me. And that was why, because he was creating that image of being my father. And I'm very grateful to this day that I view him as my dad. So uh, today's guest is Mike Robinson. This is uh, another time he has come back to be with us. We're so grateful. Mm -hmm. He has some things he wants to share about the, the prodigal son today, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing okay. it, Mike. Yeah, I was uh, reading in Luke 15, and, and you know, that's, I love that. I love that parable of the, the prodigal son, but he starts off, you know, with the lost sheep, you know, and we, we sing that song. Uh, it's pretty popular right now, you know, reckless love, how he'll leave the 99 and go for yeah. the one. But it's not, it's not just saying Jesus as the shepherd. The, the, the scripture actually says, what shepherd? In, in meaning any shepherd, if you lost one, wouldn't you go after them if you're a good shepherd? Yeah. And, and, you know, and it builds up to the father. But it's interesting to me in that parable that it goes from the lost sheep to the lost coin 
to the lost son. Mm-hmm. You know, the sheep got lost because of the shepherd's neglect. The coin got lost because of the lady's neglect. The prodigal son got lost because he wanted to be lost. And when you talk about fatherlessness, that prodigal son, that was me. I mean, that, that really rings true in my heart. Running, you know, looking to be loved by the father, looking to be not rejected, but accepted of the father. You get this total different image of a father when you look at the prodigal son. What's he do? He, he's arrogant. He takes his inheritance and he says, Dad, goodbye. I'm out of here. I'm going to go live my life. But you see this picture of a father who doesn't say, okay, you made your bed out there, you lay in it. You stay in that pig pen. You, you go ahead and spend the rest of your life. You know, you're dead to me. You're not my son. You don't see a father like that. You see a father like our heavenly father who the Bible says is the prodigal went out and spent all of his inheritance, lived it up, uh, you know, riotous living. We, we would say today he was on, you know, doing drugs, out doing the party life every night, spending all of his inheritance yeah. like a lot of people do when they hit the lottery, yeah. you know? yeah. And, um, but the father had this, didn't have this, I'm done with you. The father had this, I'm waiting on you to come home. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember even, you know, as, as, as being a father myself, I remember when my daughter had left home, um, when she was 18, every night there was this part of me that I like to go around and lock the doors in the house and make sure everybody's in bed and everything's okay. I always like staying up, be the last one to stay up. It's just something I've always done. Yeah. And when she was gone, there was just an emptiness in me that she should have been home (laughs) and she wasn't home. And, and I would start to wonder where she was. And so I see this picture of the father, like our heavenly father, like there's so many people that are lost. There's so many people that have been rejected by their father that, um, are out there just, just trying to make it on their own, but really don't even understand what's missing in their life. And um, like you said, maybe they had a, a father that was a predator, not a protector. Right. And, or maybe abused or whatever. But we see this father with the prodigal son. He spends everything. Um, naturally, this father shouldn't want him back. He's wasted his life. He's took his inheritance. He's, he's abused his dad. But we see this dad that it says, while he was still a long way off, that the father was looking. Mm-hmm. And he was, you know, he was searching for this son to come home. And it kind of chokes me up because I think of God being that kind of father yeah. that is so patient, waiting on us to go through all of our charades, mm-hmm. everything we do. And he, he's there waiting for us to turn to him and, and come home so he can love us back to life. And like what you said, with God waiting till you're ready. I yeah. mean, that's so good. That is so <clears throat> That's such an image of God the Father because he waits to the right time. Because if he showed us everything at once, we'd explode. Oh, my. <laughs> my heart couldn't handle it. No. God started dealing with me about re- the rejection in my life, the, the addiction, all these things that came um, from just, just wanting to have that father relationship that I never understood. And um, little by little, you know. Isn't it something how some people will come and say, you need to deal with that person about their language or you need to deal with that person about their smoking or whatever. Do me that too and, and, and you know what? Those are the people that I really want to use sarcasm and lash out at and say, you know what? Why don't you get the log out of your own eye? That's right. <laughs> you know? I get it. <clears throat> but, but they need help too. You know, uh, an, an old pastor told me one time, you know, when, you ha- when there's sheep uh, and you're a shepherd, You know, you always realize there's people at the back of the pack, there's people in the middle of the pack, and there's people at the front of the pack. Lots of times the ones at the front of the pack, they get the most attention. But really, we need to be concerned about those at the back of the pack and the the middle of the pack because it's not about numbers in a church or in in, in any organization. It's about faces. And there's people behind those faces. And we don't know what's in their heart, but the Father does. That's right. And he's willing to go with us for the long haul. It was so uh, neat, Joe, that I, I did a Father's Day. Uh, they asked me to come to speak at this church, and they had a lot of fathers from different denominations and churches there. And there was a, I was talking about the Father's blessing, about receiving the Father's blessing. And uh, this gentleman was 77 years old, came to the altar, and he was just tears streaming down his face. And he says, is it too late for me to have the Father's blessing? And he began to tell me about what had been done to him. He said, I've searched my whole life for what you're talking about, to to find God as a father because to me that's my whole life's what's been missing I, I didn't know how to be a dad 
Right. I've made mistakes with my own kids. I regret. He said, I'm 77 years old. Is it too late for me to have the Father's blessing? I said, no, sir, it's not. It's not too late to have a happy childhood. And I, I prayed with him and, and just saw the Father's love just start to, to pour on him. Not something that's weird, but something that's validating. Right. Something like when, when, when the Father said, when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. To know that there's a God like that, that's a father, that's pleased. It's wonderful. That, and, and I just believe for somebody that's watching today, you might be out there and you think, I'm, I'm just a total disappointment. But I feel, I feel like the Lord's saying to me that you're, you're in no way a disappointment to God. Matter of fact, he's been waiting on the day for you to come and find him as a father because that's what's been missing in, in their life. And uh, it's so good to know because you can feel like a disappointment. I have. You know, rejection in your life gives you this message. It's a total disapproval of who you are. That's rejection. In your own mind, you feel like I'm totally disapproved of. But for God to say, I'm in no way disappointed in you, man, that talk about boost you up about 10 notches. That'll do it when you understand that the God of all the universe cares enough about us that he's like in that, that prodigal son story, he's waiting for us to come even after we've spent it all. He just wants us. Amen. That's a, that's a good father. Just wants us. Wants us to laugh again. Wants to tickle us. Wants to get down on the floor with us. You know? Have a life. Yeah, have, have a, life. a life. That's it. And, you, and it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Right. Or what continent you're on. God can love you right where you're at. Yes. And uh, to, to be satisfied with yourself. You know, there's such a dissatisfaction in the world today. I, I'm going to touch just the women for, for just a minute. You know, when you, when I've almost, this, I'm not telling you, I like I feel sorry for women like they're less than. I feel sorry for them in the fact that somebody's made them try to look like somebody they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like every woman is supposed to weigh 110 pounds and be perfect and look like a model. And I'm thinking uh, that's, that's so unfair to heap that. That's like saying all the men got to have perfect builds and, and look perfect and right. make lots of money. I mean, the society has heaped so many images on people mm -hmm. that they set you up for one low self-esteem blow right. after another because every time you try to do it, it, remember, it's movies and it's cameras. It's mm -hmm. not them. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't mean that's who they are. You, that's why you find so many scandalous things about people who are in the public uh -huh. eye because that image is just that. It's an image. Yes. It's really meant to sell you clothes, to sell you uh, whiskey or whatever they use. When we were kids, they used to advertise cigarettes on TV and liquor right. on TV. But the point is, it's to make you appear. They just want to sell you something. Mm -hmm. They don't really care about what it looks like. And, mm -hmm. and, in, and we have this image that people pursue now. You can do it in church. Right. You know, everybody wanted to look like a certain preacher and, and not realizing that God made you to be you and he's mm -hmm. okay with who you are. Right. Being satisfied with yourself takes a while when you've had a really low self-esteem mm -hmm. and, and, and a bad image. Yes. And... You know, it's such an unfair thing that causes people to constantly be, with what I talked about earlier, is be on a, I got to perform to get everybody's approval. Mm -hmm. And they never find out who they are, brother, because they're always busy working, trying to accomplish something. Yes. I remember telling a guy that worked for me one time, I said, if you'd quit trying to make me happy, you could learn something. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I don't sound bad, but the point was, I didn't want him to make me happy. Right. I wanted him to learn the job so he could be happy with himself and mm -hmm. then I would be happy mm -hmm. <laughs> because he, he kept thinking he's got to do this to get the approval of his boss and to me I approved of him the day I hired him and I approved that I believed he could do it when I invested in his training. Uh -huh. So for me I thought that was settled but it wasn't because it was something he carried within him that he couldn't make people happy and so mm -hmm. he kept wanting approval and you know it's a funny thing when you try to get approval, it's the last thing you need because it'll keep you like you are. Right. So actually, God doesn't let people give it hmm. to you. He holds it back so he can break that cycle in your life uh -huh. so he can show you that you really are something without their approval, mm -hmm. which is the most important thing in the world. You know, uh, having been written off by people, you know, I, uh, I had to learn it. And mm -hmm. I, I, this sounds really funny, but I tell people, I've had the greatest privilege of being written off so many times that I got to be myself. Mm -hmm. And it worked really good for me <laughs> because when I was trying to get everybody's approval, it wasn't working. Right. 
You know, so I'll tell you a little story. I remember being in grade school, and I, and I struggled in grade school. I went to Catholic school, and it's embarrassing, but I realize it's a reality. I mean, I failed about everything at least once, you know. And school was so painful. My best day in school, listen to this, Pastor Mike, Apostle Mike. The school was closed. <laughs> and the teacher, I was playing outside in the yard with my friend Greg Peterson. And one of the teachers came out and said, we need you to move chairs. And because it was physical work and I love to work, I worked. And it was up in the furnace room that was probably 90 or 100 degrees. And then in those days, they had that asbestos wrap on all those uh, pipes. I remember that. And I'm stacking these chairs up empty in the hall because they're going to have a Christmas play or something. And I'm so excited because I'm getting to do something. And this sounds really funny, but they treated me so good because they were happy with my work. But when I went to school the next Monday, I was old stupid Joe again. Mm -hmm. He'd like to kill me. Yeah. I, mean, I was devastated because I thought, I was okay Friday. And now I'm back to getting hollered at and telling me that I don't know what I'm doing and I'm stupid. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. it's funny, I, I think I told you this, one time they put me behind a refrigerator box in the front of the class and mm -hmm. said I wasn't fit to look on. And that was where everybody else sat in chairs and I went up behind the refrigerator box during class. And they don't realize, you know, those people had no idea what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so I learned I'm not gonna make these people happy. So I kind of created Joe's world. <laughs> uh -huh. Then you wonder why people zone out uh -huh. and don't listen to you. Yes, There's a reason. And see, God had to work me through all of that. and. He allowed me to do things, and, and I learned to be an automobile dealer, etc. and then I learned about ministry. And I learned that God can work with me himself. Mm -hmm. And he surrounded me with people that could help me. Some of them were saved, and some of them were not saved. Mm -hmm. But God arranged my life so I could be have a level of success. Mm -hmm. And he had to undo all that spaghetti, so it took him time to uh, let me know that he loved me. But yes. boy, once I figured that out, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I knew he was with me. See, all these people, Mike, that are hurt and wounded, they don't believe God is with them. Mm -hmm. But he's the one that is with them. It's some other people <laughs> that they have right. to watch out for. God didn't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. God was with me all those years. And now that I look back, I see how he kept me. Yes. You know, so, so my prayer and when I... When I, I've told you this, this is how I look at my life. To him who is able to keep me from falling. Wow. I believe God keeps you. Yes, now, he does. If you keep yourself, you probably can't stay. But when God keeps you, mm -hmm. they can't take it from you because you got it honestly. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? You get it the honest <clears throat> way. If you're performing, you can lose it. But if you've got it, they can't take it. Right. When it takes you a while to get something, you kind of protect it. It's real hard mm -hmm. to take something off a guy that he had to fight to yes. get. If you went through enough to figure out that God loves you, you know, all the, all the things you had to go through, that can't be stolen. Right. It becomes yours. And I think that's what we're talking about today yeah. is your personal knowing that God loves you mm -hmm. without anybody else involved. He loves yes. you just like you are and he'll work with you just like you are and he'll put people in your life and some of them you will like and some of you won't, but he'll put the right people in your life to help you become successful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it just made me think about this year about God being with you. I think that's just the greatest, one of the greatest revelations you can have is him as father being with you. And I, I shared with you before, but, uh, you know, going through a season, this last season of my life, I came to a point where I was like, God, it, it's just like I'm driving in a rainstorm and it's raining so hard that my wipers can't keep up with the storm. Yeah. But I said in that uh, brokenness, it was like, I got a revelation that I don't see God. I don't feel God, you know, but I know he sees me. Yeah. And, and just knowing the father is watching out for me. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's, it's a game changer for your whole life. I mean, and to look yourself in the mirror and say, God's happy with me. So I'm happy. It doesn't matter who doesn't approve of me or who's approval. Because there's some people you'll never get their approval. Never. And, and, and it may be some of the people you really want their approval the most. It may be a father. It may be a mother. It might be a, a brother or sister, a close relative. You want their approval, but you just can't reach it. I always said to me in, in our high school, we had a pegboard. 
and I was I was a heavy set kid in early seventh grade in high school and trying to climb that pegboard and put those pegs in those holes in my life with with rejection it was like I would just just pull the peg out of the hole and try to reach the next hole and somebody would move the hole yes and I just couldn't just couldn't reach it just couldn't even though I had the strength to pull myself up I couldn't reach the hole yeah and that's what rejection's like to me but the father is is the one that it's it's all systematic you climb he gives you the strength to climb you climb one more peg you climb one more peg next thing you know you're at the top Mm -hmm. and that's where he wants us to end up is on top amen yeah you know I I was thinking how hard it is to get to get there sometimes you could only move an inch at a time yes that's why you got to be not quit. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think that the prizes go to all the smart people. I think you can get it if you're smart. That's great. Mm-hmm. But I think it goes to all the people that don't quit. Yes. And uh, the devil wants to steal your courage. That's what discouragement mm-hmm. is. He steals your courage. That's good. And it takes courage to to look at what you're not and still keep trying. It takes mm-hmm. courage to to keep digging. Yes. You know, I, I'm I'm sure this. I wasn't going to, to but I guess I will. When I was in maybe third grade, or whatever grade it was, we had a play. And I forgot all the lines. I was paralyzed. He says, uh, when I was a kid, I just got paralyzed in front of people. It's amazing. God, now he's got me talking to people. <laughs> I should have known there was something to it. And uh, what happened is my mother got so embarrassed in that play, and I saw her face was real red, and I have totally froze, and I just missed all the parts. And I disappointed people so bad then I made a vow. I said, I will never talk in front of people again. Wow. Now, you think those vows don't matter, all them they vows do. you make when you're a child. Listen to this one. I, I get a job and I'm selling automobiles and my employer has a remote. A remote is when you hire a TV, a radio station, and they come down and everybody, there's all this hoopla and, and all these customers come in. I didn't know what was wrong with me, but every time that he would do that, I would go down by the river and sit and not sell any cars because I didn't want to be around all mm. the people. And I didn't want near that microphone. And I realized that I'm not selling any cars and my employer is spending thousands of dollars to bring all these customers in for me to sell cars, to earn money for him and to earn money for myself. This guy was spending all this money and I was burying myself like a bad employee and I didn't want to be around all the people because mm. there was a microphone involved. And I didn't, it took me many years after I worked there to figure it out. And God said, that's that vow you made as a child. Wow. See, if you'd asked me, I would have told you I needed more money. Mm-hmm. And God told me he provided an opportunity for you to make money. You need to repent of that vow you made. That's good. Because it sticks. You mm-hmm. talk about answering for your words. I made that vow when I was in grade school and it was affecting my income mm-hmm. in my adult life. See, a lot of times we don't realize that we're cursed for the vows we made when we had got hurt real bad. Mm-hmm. And until we repent of them, we have to live in the parameter of those vows. I thought I needed money and God said, no, you need to repent so you can make some money. That's good. I provided the way for you to make money, but because you are broken, mm-hmm. you have poverty in your life because you are broken. Wow. And I want to heal you so you can prosper. How do you like that? That's good. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because now you're going to want to go back and examine your vows. Well, it's you know? interesting to me too because we're both ministers, but I made the same type of vow. Other, Mine was trying to make a speech, and I got all sweaty and, and messed it all up, and it was only a minute, and I swore I'd never make a speech again. And I, from then on, I would have an A in English so I could take a zero in speech, and that, <laughs> that, would, that would get me a C. Yeah. And that's what I did throughout school. I never made a speech. And then God calls us to preach. Right. But it's the Father's love that restores that thing, you know, that was taken from us. We were meant to do it. Well, I agree. You know? Just to touch that, to those of you who feel like you've been targeted, you know, and you, and you feel as though it's not, you know, you've been wounded trying to do something. Just to let you know, I don't know how, but the devil uh, attacks what you're supposed to be very young. Mm-hmm. If you, I'll, I'll give the two illustrations I can give you for that is he tried to kill Jesus when he was born. And they tried to kill Moses when he was born. And I can tell you today that the devil comes after what you are supposed to be doing. And how he knows, I really don't know for sure, and I'm not going to get into that. All I know is if he sees any potential in you, he tries to damage you so you can't deliver. And God wants to heal you today. Yes. 
so you can deliver the mail. God wants to heal you so you can do the things that are available to you. There are many careers that are ahead of people, many job opportunities, many marriages, many good things that God has for you, but sometimes you can't enter into them with the mindset you have. The same way I couldn't enter into that sale and, and, and generate some income for my family because of the perception and the vow that I had made. So let's pray today. Let's pray for these people today, uh, Apostle Mike. I tell you what, why don't you lead them in prayer and give them an opportunity to pray with you so they can break some of those vows and maybe get on with their life. If, you, if they've said anything about themselves that's not true, that the devil wanted to create that bad image. Go, okay, go ahead sure and pray thing. with them today. You know, today I just, I know that the inner vows are very important. Even one I made from rejection that, that I would never cry again, that nobody would ever make me cry again as a, as a little kid. And whatever, if it's what Joe was talking about or what we've been talking about, that you have that inner vow, we're just going to pray right now. Father, I, I just, uh, if there's anyone watching today, God, that has made a, a vow uh, or has been just wounded or sidetracked by rejection or uh, fatherlessness today or, or no parents, God, or even an orphan, I just pray today, God, that you'd bring healing to them, that you would you would minister life and healing to them right where they are. And Lord, bring to the remembrance any inner vow they made that needs broken. And Lord, we break those vows right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Apostle Mike. You're welcome. And we're just going to touch a little bit more on that. If you are watching this and you have never accepted Jesus and you have heard enough of the gospel, to decide that's what you want to do. We're not talking you into anything because you have to believe it for yourself. But Jesus did come to take the punishment that you were supposed to get for every sin you ever committed. I know that sounds extreme because you know there's been a lot of severe sins in this world, but God put all of those sins upon one man and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you want to receive the forgiveness he has for you, I'm gonna pray with you now too. Father, I come in the name of Jesus. I repent of my sin. And I accept that Jesus stepped forward and said, punish me instead of punishing them. And let them go to heaven, Father, because they believe on me. I thank you, Lord, for dying for our sin. I thank you that these people that are praying this prayer will find a local church and a pastor, somebody to watch over them. I thank you, God, that there will be a significant difference in their life, life as of right now. There'll be a tangible anointing inside of them that they will know that God now abides in them and they are a new creature. Thank you for the born again experience for these people, God. Give them a desire to read your word and a desire to fellowship with the saints in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it. Uh, we hope this program was beneficial to you to do that today. Thank you for being with us. We love and appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen.